This is Interviews with Technical People with John Robertson and James Savio, a podcast where we interview technical people in STEM fields to discuss the past, present, and future from their perspective. Today, we're joined by Jeremy Harmon, a, a flight instructor specializing in tailwheel and float planes, and also an aspiring bush pilot who flies to islands on the main coast. Uh, Jeremy, welcome to the show. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me. So, Jeremy, uh, great to have you on. Why don't we start with a very broad question? Why don't you just tell us in your own words, what is it that you do? So, what I do is I'm a commercial pilot and also a certified flight instructor. And one thing that most folks think when they hear commercial pilot, oh, you fly, you know, big, big airliners, big jets. That's not necessarily the case. You know, the aircraft that I fly is, you know, a small six seat airplane and was built in the 1970s. Really? The, yeah. The, um, the technical job description is an air taxi pilot. Uh, we operate on demand. So when the customer wants to go, we go. And we fly to nine islands off the coast of Maine, and we bring in the mail, the groceries, FedEx, UPS, people, you name it, we fly it. What's the, so you, you said you bring the mail, the groceries, you name it, we, I, we'll name it, you fly it. Yep. What's, what's, what's the strangest thing you've ever had to fly? <laughs> strangest thing that I've ever had to fly um, it was a few years ago. We had a wildlife vet out on one of the islands, out on Matinicus, and she had baby raccoons. And that was probably the most unique that I have flown. They're trying to populate but, the island with raccoons? No, there's a funny story about that that uh, that'll be for another night. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, she... Um, what she does, what she actually, you know, takes care of, you know, abandoned, you know, wild critters. And she, she's brought everything from baby raccoons. Uh, last year she had a bobcat and you just never know what she's going to walk in the door with going to the island. So, so Maine's a pretty, uh, how do I describe Maine? <laughs> I'm talking to two Mainers right now. <laughs> So tell us about these remote islands and uh, maybe why don't you need a, a 747 flying out <laughs> to these islands? <laughs> um, so there's nine islands out in the Penobscot Bay area that we fly to. Um, and you take it, one like Matinicus where it's, you know, two miles long and a mile wide, you know, at its you know, widest point. So you wouldn't exactly have the room to fit, you know, something like a 747 in there. All the runways that we fly to um, are short in, you know, what the average pilot would consider, you know, short for runways. Are they all and gravel? Majority of them are gravel or grass. Um, I think the only two paved runways we go to outside of Rockland are uh, Islesboro and Stonington. And those are, you know, again, the, the long runways at 2,000 feet long. So, so the shortest the shortest runway we go into is a thousand feet long, um, and that's out on the island of North Haven. So how, how would that compare? To get the plane off. Well, somewhere in the ballpark of five hundred feet. How does that compare to a runway at, like, say, a major, you know, commercial hub? You know, like like Atlanta. it would be probably about the size of the numbers that they paint on the runways at, you know, something like LaGuardia. It's not necessarily a big runway. Yeah. And when you fly over and you look down at it, I've had a lot of people say, you know, where are you landing? Well, you see that driveway down there? Yeah. Well, that's where I'm landing. And it looks like a, you know, gravel driveway. Wow. And another thing I think is worth pointing out, you know, with why this is important is a couple of those islands, you know, the ferry goes out to a dozen times a day. We talk about Matinicus and the ferry goes out, what? twice a week or something a couple times a month so, so you... yeah but yeah what we you know the service that we provide is we can get you there in in 10 minutes as opposed to the ferry taking an hour and a half two hours you know somewhere in that ballpark 
where you have to play, uh, you know, play the line down at the ferry terminal. You have to get a number, you know, am I going to make it on this boat? Am I not going to make it on this boat? Um, you know, again, it's a, it's a convenience. It's a, a I wouldn't call it a luxury, but it kind of is. And that goes not only for like flying just out of Owl's Head out to the islands, but we fly down to Portland, Maine, we fly to Augusta and Bangor and we'll pick, you know, folks up who fly in off of, you know, the main line, you know, aircraft, walk over to, you know, the small general aviation terminal, jump in our airplane and they're direct to, you know, whichever island they're going to, they're there in 30 minutes as opposed to driving two hours up Route 1, having to deal with traffic down at Red Zeets in Wiscasset or whatever kind of construction the main DOT has going on on the interstate. And you do, you do medical evacuations too, is right? Yep, we do fly medevac flights. Um, and we used to do those, you know, day and night. Um, the owner of the company recently passed away about a month ago, and he was kind of our primary nighttime medevac pilot. So we've kind of steered away from doing those, you know, just from a safety standpoint, just kind of cutting down on the exposure that way. I want to hear a little bit more about the aircraft that you fly, because James and I actually talk about this a lot. I have this fascination with pilots um, and, and anyone who, who, who I'll say captains a large craft, whether it be a plane or a boat. So I'm just fascinated with how well, you know your vehicle. Like for example, I drive my car around. I don't know what's under that hood, right? I mean, I have a, I have a general idea, but I'm always so impressed with, with anyone such as yourself or someone who pilots you know, that type of vehicle and just how well you have to know it. Um, can, can we just talk about that a little bit, sort of your own aircraft and, and how that goes? So for the, like for the company airplanes at, at the Air Taxi, we every year have to go through a recurrent ground school and part of that is aircraft systems. So we talk about the engines, we talk about the fuel system, we talk about the, some of the electrical system, um, different components with the landing gear. And so every year we kind of get a little bit of, you know, recurrency in that, but as you know, pilots in general, part of our, training is to you know 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 the systems know okay if i you know push forward the houses get bigger i pull back the houses get smaller well why does it do that um so you know knowing the the flight controls knowing the engine system and you know as you kind of pointed out every every airplane is different every vehicle is different so what, uh, you know, my personal airplane, you know, has for an engine and it is totally different than the ones that I fly for work. The concepts are all the same, you know, it's a horizontally opposed, you know, mine's a four cylinder engine, the work ones are six cylinder engines. Mine's 125 horse, the work ones are 300 horse. Hang on, what does horizontally opposed mean? So it actually, it's how the cylinders for the engine are laid out and you can think of it, um, like a Subaru engine. So the cylinders actually sit horizontally across and they oppose each other. So you have one cylinder on one side, you have one cylinder on the other side, as opposed to something like a inline where all cylinders are in the you know, in a line um, or a radial engine where they're in a circle, they're designed in a circle around a, a case. Interesting. I think Subaru is the only car company that uses the, uh, yep, four I cylinder think, opposed engine. Yep, I think they they do. Huh? Yeah. Okay. So so you know that you have a horizontally opposed and what? What? Why? Uh, why is that worth knowing? Are, are there certain differences in how it operates? Or it's it's not necessarily like the type of engine. You know, the, the horizontally opposed versus a radial, uh, mm -hmm. the V engine stuff like that. But it's knowing. I'd call it, you know, the nitty gritties of it, the, okay, this is how the fuel system on my engine works versus this is how the fuel system on, you know, the company airplane works. An example of that is, you know, the engine in my plane is carbureted 
as opposed to something like the work airplane, which is fuel injected. So there's certain, you know, things we have, what in my airplane, what's called carburetor heat. It pulls hot air off of the exhaust manifold, puts it into the, the carburetor system in the airplane. So that way it prevents icing. The company airplane doesn't have that. The company airplane has, um, like I said, fuel injection, so it doesn't have to worry about a, a carburetor and jets and all that stuff. And that's a lot like car technology, where the carburetor is a bit older, a little smaller. Yeah. The fuel yep. injection is a little more modern. But mm -hmm. your personal plane is also a bit older than the company planes, too. Yep. Yep. 1958. So I, I think this is also worth pointing out. So you, you have your own personal plane, and then you also fly around – how many company planes is it like is it, are you always in the same one or is there a rotation no no it varies um so we have at penobscot island air we get seven yeah seven company airplanes which are all cessna 206 or 207 models and they call them the the station air was the name that they came up with um the aircraft that i own personally and operate as uh, my flight school is a 1958 Piper Super Cub. It's a little two-seat tube and fabric design and it's probably one of the you know one of the best airplanes out there at what it does for its you know size category. Hmm. And then you've got another airplane I know of as well that... No, oh, geez I got airplanes <laughs> like to read about <laughs> but uh no I have a 46 Aronk Champ which is my dad's that I'm actually totally restoring. And if you ask me in two weeks how it's going, I'll tell you to come back and ask me in another two weeks. I know we've been through this. Yeah, once or twice. But as you point out, John, I mean, Jeremy has to know the mechanics. He's rebuilding this plane, like, from the ground up. So he has to know literally every mechanism of the, of the aircraft. So, but, but there's, there's some, still some basic similarities, right? At what point would the plane have to be so different? And I, I know it's a whole conversation about like certification and everything. At mm -hmm. what point would a plane be so different to where you, to where you wouldn't be able to fly it? Or, or is it the moment you have a new aircraft, like, like a, the moment you have a different model, are you at that point? How, how does that work? How different are these different models to fly? Um, some can be pretty different where you'll find a lot of differences depending on, and it depends on the airplane. It depends on how the owner has set them up is all in the, the avionics, all in the instruments, the radios mm -hmm. where they may have said, you know, eh, I want a you know, full digital display, everything, you know, moving map, touch screen, you know, imagine putting an iPad right in front of your face and it has, all of your instruments and it's what we would call a, a glass display you know everything is all computers as opposed to something like my cub or the work airplanes where we have what they call analog or steam gauges some guys call them where it's all you know needles and, and numbers it's all just old gauges and it's all the original technology that you know was out there and started back when i'm assuming those don't have autopilot and uh, uh ours don't no unfortunately but they they can you know that's again an aftermarket thing that somebody can add oh okay so but but it, it wasn't on the original about what year did that technology start becoming widespread oh man um i mean there were some early models early model cessnas that had them you know back in the 70s, 60s and 70s, I think. Um, you can kind of trace, you know, real primitive autopilots back to around World War II, even. Wow. But we're talking, you know, kind of primitive stuff. Yeah. Well, I don't even know what that would look like. So it's more yeah. of how much money you want to put into it sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um. Sorry, I have a, I have another question. This one fascinates me. So let's just say you're, 
you you have a destination, right? You you have a you have a starting point and a destination. Mm -hmm. What de what determines what typical altitude you'll fly at? Um, terrain is a big one, and weather. Um, if you're going, an example being here to Matinicus. Matinicus is twelve miles off the coast of Maine, and there's three smaller islands really between here and there. So you want to fly the airplanes that we fly at work don't have uh, floats underneath them. We fly, you know, wheeled aircraft. So we don't have the water landing capability. That being the case, God forbid something happens, you know, we need to be, you know, ideally landing on land. Mm -hmm. So that would merit, you know, flying at a higher altitude if something were to fail, such as the engine, which is, I don't want to say would be the most common um, problem, but it, it would be. It did happen. Um, <laughs> so that would be, you want to be at an altitude or a height above you know, the ground that if something does happen like that, you have the glide distance to get to, you know, in our case, you know, even a little spit of land, you know, going out to the islands. Um, again, sometimes due to weather, you don't necessarily have, you know, the best, you know, altitude for that. So there's, you know, give and take in certain places, but flying like tonight, flying from, you know, where I was teaching today and flying back here, I have floats under my airplane. I can land in any body of water that I really you know, see fit, you know, God forbid something happens. And, you know, again, I can also land on, land on a road. I can land in the field. I can, you know, really go anywhere with it in the case of an emergency. So I may fly a little bit lower than say going out to an Island. Interesting. I, I, I would have thought there might've been some consideration. Maybe, maybe there isn't for, for efficiency. It is, are there any advantages say to flying higher or lower? Um, for there is, and it depends on, on kind of which way you're going. The certain airplanes do perform better up at higher altitudes. Um, the engines run a little bit better. You can get some good fuel efficiency. And not only that, but you can, depending on which way the wind's blowing, you can, you know, catch a pretty good tailwind or mm -hmm. avoid, you know, a really bad headwind. And an example of that was you know, flying from here to, to California in a small single engine Cessna, I, I flew, you know, fairly low to the ground, you know, about 2,000, 2,500 feet from here to there, just because any higher, and I would have been dealing with, you know, stronger winds coming directly out of the way that I was, the direction I was headed. So it would have slowed me down. So in order to avoid that, I stayed lower where the winds were lighter. Um, vice versa, if I was coming from California or the West Coast and coming east, chances are I'm going to fly at a higher altitude, catch a good tailwind, and I can gain some efficiency there. Interesting. Um, is there... So I, you, you're, you're describing the size of these airplanes and they're generally i i think it's safe to say they're on the smaller side right oh yeah um, okay what's the what's the highest altitude that they're capable of flying at and and what what limits that i'm, I'm and uh, i'm asking a bunch of these questions because i'm actually really fascinated by this like what what determines the ideal altitude for any given aircraft because you know sometimes i hear stories about these aircraft from back in like the cold war days that would fly at crazy high altitudes Probably for other reasons, right? Probably maybe to avoid yeah. being seen for other reasons. But it, the yeah. question um, the it really depends on a few different things. You know, one of it is you know, okay, if I'm going a short trip, you know, Owls Head, Maine to to Portland, am I really going to climb to ten thousand feet to? you know, maybe save a few gallons of gas in the long run just because of good wind, you know, maybe not. It does it, you know, 
it takes time to get up to altitude. It takes time to come back down from altitude. Right. So depending on the length of the trip, depending on, you know, again, what kind of mission is it, that would, you know, be one of the you know, determining factors in that. Mm -hmm. As far as, you know, like an average altitude for, you know, the planes that we fly, I would say, you know, some, you know, definitely under 5,000 feet, you know, can you take them higher? Absolutely. I've taken a, you know, something similar to what we fly up to, you know, 10,000 feet. Mm -hmm. And, you know, did we gain anything? I didn't think we did. You know, we could see a lot more. That was about <laughs> it. Um, Better view. I like being yeah. close to the ground where I can see more detail though. Yeah, exactly. I'm terrified of heights by the way. How could that be possible? <laughs> Don't know. Um, you also mentioned that you do some uh, instruction work, that you're a flight instructor. Is that yep. part of uh, that, that same role that you have of, of flying out to the islands, or is that a, a different uh, uh, area? Partial, partially. Um, the, at the at Penobscot Island Air, I'm one of the several company flight instructors so if we get a new pilot you know i'm part of the you know the training element in that regards but more so what my flight instructor you know duties are or what i you know do um is i train people how to fly you know if somebody comes up and says hey i want to learn how to fly an airplane perfect you know that we take them right from zero to getting their license i've um, I've, I've learned that You'll show anyone around an airplane and mm. tell them all about it. Twist my arm, you know. <laughs> it, it, it's worth pointing out that the only ride I've ever had in a small plane was with Harmon. Yep. Was it to an island in Maine? Uh, we didn't land on any islands, but he did give me a nice tour of the bay. And we went up around Beautiful. the mountain and over the islands and yep. you know, out so and around. So the people who would show up like to, to your company, they probably are, are already – pilots right and then you would teach them sort of the the last part like the ins and outs of that particular plane no nope, not necessarily um oh showing up to showing up to you know i guess i'll separate that showing up to work for the air taxi it would be more fine you're right they already know how to fly they already have 500 hours at minimum Okay. And it's just getting them familiar with our model of aircraft, getting them familiar with the island operations, you know, the day in, day out, and the short runways that we operate in and out of. Um, shifting gears over to my company, to my flight school, you know, that's, you know, any Johnny off the street that wants to learn how to fly comes in with zero experience. Hey, I saw this on, you know, YouTube once all right, you know, let's go learn how, you know, I'm going to teach you how to fly. Um, some of the things that I tend to specialize in a little bit more or what I try to focus on is uh, seaplane and tailwheel um, flying. So seaplane, flying an airplane that can land in the water and tailwheel airplane where there's two main landing gear up forward on the airplane and one steerable wheel on the back of the airplane and yeah those two are kind of you know more my favorite to teach it's a little bit more advanced than just you know learning how to fly it's a whole new skill set it's a whole new realm of flying that so, some people really don't get into so when you're just first teaching someone to fly you don't start with the tail wheel right you or, or do you well, I know a few places that do, and if I had my, my wits about me, I probably would start them in that because, in my opinion, flying a tailwheel airplane makes you a better pilot oh. um, just because of its inherent ability of it wants to, the tail of the airplane wants to come around in front of you, um, and that's just due to where the center of gravity is, the distance between the center of gravity and the back of the plane, um, Yeah, it's it keeps you on, on your toes. Interesting. Now your your personal plane is a tailwheel, right? When it's not on floats, yeah. 
Yeah. And the company ones are more of the standard configuration. Yep. The, the tricycle gear, which actually is technically considered non-conventional. Tailwheel airplane was considered a conventional airplane. Okay. But it's a little more specialized nowadays. It, yeah. Uh, the conventional landing gear, the tailwheel landing gear, they started getting away from that, you know, kind of, kind of in the 60s and 70s there were some airplanes that were still you know being produced that had it but a majority of airplanes started switching over to the tricycle gear um they're stable they're as some would say easier to fly but um Tr tricycle being the multiple rear wheels and the the front one single front wheel that turns one one nose wheel yep so nose two main wheel. wheels and one and one nose wheel yep okay like a tricycle. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Seaplanes. Those things are amazing. I love them. Uh, so w what are those? Um, so, so first of all, what do you call them? Skis? Like the, the actual, or the, the floats that, that floats. they land on? Floats. Yeah, floats. What? What are those made out of? And are they like retractable? How does that whole process work? So they can be made out of, um, most common is aluminum or uh, composites. And both have their advantages, both have their disadvantages. Um, how they are, you know, rigged to the aircraft is just that. They have rigging, they have bracing, both in, um, you know, tubular structure and wire and cable attachments that are tightened. And they, they just hang down below the aircraft. Um, they don't retract. Some floats have little wheels in them that you can either electrically or hydraulically raise or lower into the floats. And those are what we would call amphibious floats because you can land on land or you can land on water. So I guess, I guess that's what I was wondering. If you have a, a, a seaplane, is that the right term? Mm -hmm. uh, can, can you land on land or are you limited? You can only land on water. If you have an airplane like mine, um, which is a, what we would call a straight float plane, um, straight float plane being it only has floats. There are no, wheels in the floats it's not an amphibian um you're limited from body of water to body of water interesting which makes it very interesting when you're trying to get gas um because unlike an amphib or amphibian airplane you have the wheels i can land at any airport that you know has gas and then go off and land on you know no name pond in northern Maine and go fishing. My airplane, not so much. It's water to water. In the event of an emergency, yes, I could land on, you know, a field or pavement. Is it gonna hurt the is it gonna hurt the floats? It's gonna take the paint off the bottom and probably wear down some, you know, the aluminum keel on the bottom. Mm -hmm. Is it repairable? Absolutely. Hmm. Have you ever had to do that? I have not. Okay, you know, uh, that's good. Knock on wood. Yeah. Wood, wood. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, go ahead, Jane. I say, where do you get gas? Do you have to go to like a gas station on a on a lake, or you know? So there know the spots. A gas station on the lake. <laughs> you you kind of have to know the know the players. The uh, we're fortunate in Maine that we have still have some seaplane bases, which a seaplane base is just a you know, a water airport for float planes. Um, and there's a few of them that do have wa uh, fuel on the water. However, it's not how it used to be. It's not like it's Alaska. The fuel on the water is starting to be a rarity. Um, but there are still a handful of places in the state of Maine that, you know, will sell aviation fuel on the water. There's a lot of marinas, um, or I say a lot, there's a few marinas that do sell the, the automotive fuel that doesn't have ethanol in it. And depending on whether or not your aircraft engine is certified to run non-ethanol gas, 
in a pinch, you could go to a marina and, you know, get gas there. So there's a few more options, you know, out there. Unfortunately for Maine, we don't have too many marinas on fresh water. Um, so that limits it again. And there's to, ethanol you know, in most of the gas in the state now too. Yep. Yep. There's that too. So what a lot of guys, you know, to get fuel on the water, what a lot of guys will do is take a couple five gallon cans, fill them up at the airport, lug them down to their airplane, put gas in and then go fly them. Is, is it just um, like you mentioned ethanol being one problem besides the ethanol, is it similar to the gas you would put in just a car engine? Um, the, the automotive gas or what we call mo gas would be it's straight gas. It's not, you know, laced with ethanol. Um, I think the equivalent of like a 91 octane is what it is. Um, and it's kind of what people seek out for the small engines and mm. the chainsaws and stuff like that. Um, compare that and aviation fuel or avgas um avgas has is 100 octane and low lead or ll so we'll call it 100 100 ll um hmm. which it actually has little you know lead particles in it which helps in the cooling of uh of the engine operations. It, uh, the lead absorbs some of the heat. You're still running uh, leaded gas then. Yep. 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 If you were to try to put hundred octane, you know, hundred LL through your car nowadays and thinking that you're going to be doing a good stroke of business, all it's going to do is uh, clog up the catalytic converter and it's not going to be a fun time. Interesting. So when you say low lead, that's as opposed to no lead that, right. That, that right. Most cars use. Interesting. No. Oh. The cars used but, to use lead? Oh yeah, so go ahead. I, yeah, yeah up I th to no, the seventies. Huh. Yeah, something like that. Lead. But I think the uh the leaded um you know, the hundred octane gases, a lot of guys that you know put that in snowmobiles, dirt bikes, motorcycles, lawnmowers, and because it according to the the smart folks out there, it keeps better. It doesn't attract water um as much or something of that degree i believe lead, okay as it lead's also a good uh lubricant in the pistons as well in the engine yep and it doesn't the you know the fuel itself also just doesn't gel up if it hasn't been used in a really long time um so if guys are you know winterizing boats or winterizing motorcycles most of them will put you know 100 octane in to keep it through the winter I'm still just blown away that my whole life I would see a sign in a gas station that says unleaded fuel. And I never thought twice about why there didn't need to be any lead. In. <laughs> yeah. Huh? Yeah, I think, I think they get rid of it in automobiles in the seventies. Uh, NASCAR got rid of leaded gas about a decade ago. Interesting. Hmm. So, uh, you mentioned something, Jeremy. So the the float planes uh, or, or the, the the sea planes that that you have, there are they freshwater only, or can you take them in salt water as well? The yes, freshwater is kind of your friend. Salt water, unless you have like a composite float, which I don't, you kind of avoid it like um, the plague. Yeah. Um, you can you can land, you know, aluminum floats in in salt water. The only issue that you're going to run into is going to be corrosion. Um, whereas something like a composite float, you don't have to worry about it as, as much. Um, the rest of the airplane, you still have to, you know, kind of hose down and right. Yeah. It's not treat, and, and treat and treat with care. And there's I a lot my of bike things. to the beach and the chain starts to rust and I'm, I'm still a yeah. hundred feet away from the beach. <laughs> um, and not only that, but like, you know, when an airplane in the day, you know, and Cessna was still producing airplanes, you know, in a pretty good quantity. Um, you could call the factory and say, hey, I want a Cessna 185 and I want it to be done with a seaplane kit. And they would actually put in 
the reinforcements for the float plane. Um, and they would also zinc chromate in between the skins, mm. which added, um, added to that, you know, corrosion proofing. And they would also run uh, stainless steel cables. Okay. So as, as much as possible, resisting the, the corrosive effects of this. Yep. Do all you can, even if the airplane was going to be used in fresh water. Right, right, right. Um, Oh, amazing. And you know, I it's funny. That... When I picture seaplanes, uh, and, and, you know, I, I know this is not true. It's just my stereotype. I picture people, like, flying them in the Caribbean, right? Some guy who, like, owns an island. Oh, they, they, they fly them down there all, all over the place. And it, it's just funny to hear that there's this whole world in, like, Maine and Alaska that also flies them. Um, in Maine, you always see them out on the lakes. and I mean, lakes yep. are a lot calmer than the ocean, too. Well, a lot friendlier. Wonderful. Yeah. The uh, it is kind of interesting what I found, you know, flying, you know, to all the different lakes and ponds up here is it's like somebody's, you know, never seen an airplane before when all of a sudden one lands on the water. All the cell phones come out, all the cameras come out, <laughs> all the boats are trying to come up beside you and be like, you know, whoa, that's kind of cool. And sometimes it can be a little bit of a pain, you know, especially on takeoff and landing. Um, but no, it's nor it's usually well received. I mean, I would be one of those guys with the cameras. <laughs> <Probably>. <laughs> if I saw just having a nice peaceful day on the lake and then in comes the plane for a landing. I mean, it's it's unusual, right? I I'm I'm sure, I'm sure it's something you don't see every day. It's definitely I'm, not a uh, not a normal thing. A month or two ago, I was out walking around one day, and I actually saw two float planes go over me in formation. And uh, I've, I've never seen that before, and it turned out that actually Jeremy was in one of them. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> what are the odds? <laughs> um, I texted him, I go, is that you? Yeah, that was me. <laughs> uh, Jeremy, I, there's, a, there's a couple of questions that we like to ask uh, every time we do a podcast i think now would be a good time to do them we've talked a lot about what what you do and everything can you tell us a little bit as far as how you got to where you are how does one become a pilot um and you know, you know going far back you know even how did you decide you wanted to be a pilot the as james can probably tell you um i knew you know very early on that i wanted to do this kind of flying and do become a pilot um, have my own business, you know, whether that was an air taxi of my own or a flight school like I currently have. And it was a few different things. One of them being um, my dad had his airplane. And even though it actually, I've never seen it fly. I've never flown in it. I said the last um, time it was flew was before we were born, wasn't it? Yeah, 1989. 88 or 89 yeah okay. i think was the last time it flew but it just sat out in the backyard kind of collecting dust and rotting away and it was just kind of there as a okay i'm going to restore that one of these days and it's going to fly again mm. um another thing was my dad took me up to the international seaplane flying up in greenville up on moosehead lake and i've been going to that fairly religiously ever since i was a little kid so that got me around the seaplanes and, you know, kind of the, some of the older air taxis that there's only a handful of them up there now that were flying hunters and fishermen into the North main woods and would have canoes strapped to the floats. And I thought that was, the, I thought that was the coolest thing out there. Wow. Um, so between, you know, those two things and there was another, there was a movie that my dad had recorded on VHS that I just about wore the tape out of. And uh, John Denver was in it. He was a bush pilot up in Alaska and flew a couple of float planes. And I said, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to fly up in Alaska and fly float planes and, and so on and so forth. Haven't gotten up there yet, but, you know, never know what's going to happen. I love how John Denver just snuck into the story. 
I, uh, I, 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 I think we shared this already, Harmon, uh, or you and I did, but he is probably my favorite musician um, ever. <laughs> so I love when he pops yep. in when least expected. Yeah, I, I, I want to point out that uh, Harmon and I have been friends since about middle school, high school time. And mm -hmm. I, I tried to talk him into studying some other things. He kept going, no, I'm going to be a pilot. And I was like, no, 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 let's, let's do this other stuff. Goes, no, I'm going to be a pilot. <laughs> yep. And uh, damn it, well, that's what he's doing these days. So mm -hmm. can't say he was wrong. I find that a lot of pilots, maybe you found this in your own experience, uh, they knew from a pretty young age. It wasn't like they just woke up one day and decided they wanted to be a pilot. It sounds like that's your story as well. Yeah, and I'd say that's the case with a lot of guys too. Yeah. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, like me where, you know, could have told you right in elementary school, yep, this is what I'm going to do. And it's not just, you know, I'm going to be a pilot. It's like, yep, I'm going to do, I'm going to be a bush pilot. I'm going to be flying in Alaska. I'm going to be, you know, flying in the back country. I knew that very early on. You get a lot of guys that, you know, go to an air show or they go to, you know, a museum and they start looking at, you know, older airplanes and, you know, they say, yeah, I want to, want to do something like that. Mm -hmm. I, this is, this is reminding me of a question. I, I was going to ask it a little earlier, but so you, you teach a lot of brand new pilots, right? They come in, they never flown a plane before. Yep. What is, what is kind of the first, what's the first and or most important thing that you need to teach these, these people? You know, what, 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 what's the thing you, you want to get right? Um, that's a really good question. The, the first thing that we kind of teach them is how the airplane is controlled and how we, how you take off, how you land, um, how you actually, you know, manipulate the controls when you're in flight to keep the airplane level or make a turn or climb. Um, and we do a fair bit of groundwork before actually, you know, jumping in the airplane and going. Mm -hmm. um, so that way they have hopefully a little bit of an understanding of, you know, what the hell is going to happen when we get in the airplane. And, you know, some folks are, you know, very visual. Some folks are, you know, would much rather read it in a book. Um, and I find that, you know, a lot of the guys who are, you know, okay, get me hands on with something. You put them in the airplane, like, okay, yeah, this is, I get this now. Um, because it's unlike a car where you're not moving in, you know, two dimensions. You're moving in, you know, three dimensions when you're in the airplane. Um, so there, there's a lot happening. And... does that come naturally to a lot of people adding that third dimension and all the controls that you need to some you know some it comes you know naturally others it takes a little bit of time um pretty fortunate that i haven't had to tell any of my students you ought to take up golf because flying airplanes isn't for you <laughs> um I haven't had to do that yet thank god you, sh you should have the bag of golf clubs ready just to make it a joke when it happens <laughs> It sure would be funny. The, um, but no, some get it and some take a little bit of time and, you know, a couple of hard landings that, you know, they learn from and say, Oh man, I really don't want to do that again. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, sometimes they got to scare themselves a little bit. Sometimes they get to scare you a little bit. And, you know, in the end, like I said, it's, it's worked out. Do you have any had, to get, go okay. ahead? Do you have any to get about halfway in and go, no, this isn't what I wanted to do? I, I've had a few, um, and I think probably the one that I was getting, you know, closest to saying, you know, hey, we ought to have a have a talk about this. Um, you know, they came up and said, you know, yeah, I'm not feeling it anymore. Um, one of the other things that I found is, you know, depending on the The, the demographics, you know, the age, you know, the different, you know, age categories and whatnot, that'll also kind of influence, you know, a little bit of motivation, a little bit of, uh, 
you know, their drive to, you know, okay, yeah, I'm going to, you know, go home and study my books or, well, I'm really just relying on every time we go flying to, you know, have you tell me what I need to know type stuff. Who's more motivated? Um, that one, I, I'd say the jury's still out on that one because I feel in today's, you know, modern society of everything is, you know, right at your fingertips. You would think that some people, you know, you know, that would be everything. And, you know, all this information is right at your fingertips to go and fly and learn how to fly. You know, I also think that, you know, they, you know, Ooh, I got my phone and my iPad in my hand. It's just as easy to go watch, you know, stupid videos on YouTube than it is to, you know, study how to land this airplane. So I think, I think it's a little bit of 50, 50, um, you know, between, you know, again, all the, the age groups, but off the top of my head, the ones who are motivated are the ones that are kind of doing it and they have a purpose to do it. The, you know, they're, they're like me. They say, you know, dad had an airplane. I'm going to learn how to fly or grew up building, you know, model airplanes and always loved it. And, you know, yeah, I want to do this. The ones that are kind of just like, you know, eh, what the hell? Those are the ones that you can kind of see that don't necessarily put forth the, you know, the extra effort to go out of their way to do it. Okay. Hmm. I guess on that note, there's another question that we like to ask, which is, um, what's your feeling on the, on the future of what you do, whether that's the people who are flying the next generation of planes or, or where the technology is going? Um, what are you excited about? Or conversely, what are you worried about? Um, there's a part of me that feels and hopes that there's always going to be a need for this kind of flying. I mean, there's always going to be a need for instructors that I know. Um, there's always going to be a need for a pilot in the cockpit, in my opinion, um, as opposed to an automated system or drones or, you know, stuff like that. I will say that, you know, the unmanned aerial systems, UAS is, you know, no pun intended, taking off in oh, no. and going, you know, to some pretty extraordinary, you know, places as far as the capabilities and what they can do um, without putting a pilot, you know, at risk, without, you know, putting passengers at risk. It's pretty impressive, but I think you're always going to have to have somebody making the, making the go, no go decision, um, you know, driving the bus in this case, the, you know, what worries me about the industry is kind of how some things are construed just as far as, you know, oh, if you're going to be a commercial pilot, you know, you, you have to be an airline pilot or a corporate pilot, you know, that's, that's where the money is, you know, that's where, you know, the benefits are, you know, that's, so you, that's what you, you, were, you, you were never interested in flying one of those big planes. You no, still to this day, I have no burning desire to do that whatsoever. And that's, that's more so because, you know, this is the kind of flying that I enjoy, that I like, you know, I like being, I like kind of flying by the seat of your pants as opposed to you take off your 200 feet, you push a button, then you pull out your magazine and you start reading. You know, I, I like flying airplanes um, instead of monitoring systems. And I feel like a lot of the places like where I went to school, um, where I went to school, it was a college. It was a aviation based college and their primary focus was to get you a, put you through a program and you, you had to color inside the lines. You had to, you know, the instant you got out, outside the lines a little bit, you know, 
oh no, that's that's foreign territory. You don't you don't go there type stuff. Um, what, what, what kind of what would that look like? Um, I would say something you know the, the tailwheel, for example, mm-hmm. or you know even just one good case of that that I can remember was you know between the glass cockpit and you know steam gauges. I had a guy that. I had a guy in school who it was a bluebird day. It was absolutely gorgeous, not a cloud in the sky. And he was all in a tizzy because he couldn't go flying. I asked him why he couldn't go flying. Oh, they don't have an airplane for me. You know, look out on the flight line. There's, you know, 70 Cessna 172 airplanes out there. And it's just like, we get 70 of these things. You mean to tell me that not a single one's available? No, no, no. I don't fly those things. I don't fly those. I, you know, those all have, you know, steam gauges. I don't know what I, what I'd be doing with those, you know, glass, got to be glass. And there was a lot of us who flew uh, or worked with the world war II trainers and fighters and whatnot when we were out in, out in school, just the community out there, you know, got to fly and got to, you know, be around them. And, you know, a few of us thought that was, you know, that was awesome. And anytime he'd see something like that, Oh man, those things are dinosaurs. They ought to be hanging in museums. They, you know, I wouldn't, you know, unless somebody has, you know, jet time or turbine time or glass panel time, you know, I don't want to hear what they have to say. You know, they can't teach me anything. And it's like, actually, I'm pretty sure those guys can teach you a lot. Yeah. And so that was, you know, one, that's one fear I have for the industry is it's going to get to that point where, you know, some of these old school, again, more traditional ways of learning to fly and types of airplanes that you're flying is no longer the norm is no longer the, call it the accepted, you know, way of flying. But, but, but that's the way it, like what you're saying, that's the way it is in so many things. Like for example, I learned to scuba dive and Mm -hmm. before you can dive with a dive computer, which basically does everything for you, you have to learn how to do it the old fashioned way. You have to learn how to read charts uh, for how long you can be under and and learn how to use the gauges the old fashioned way. And then once you master that, then you can graduate to basically the computer that that does everything for you. it's, it's, It's amazing to think that people, that some people think you can just skip those steps and be safe there's i was talking about it with two of my students today um there's a program called four flight and it's everything that you could really ever need you know i used to lug around a you know 20 pound flight bag full of you know different flight computers different uh manuals books you know all kinds of different things and every single one of them had you know different information in it that pertained to what I was doing. Now you can put it all on your phone Mm. and it's all kind of housed in, you know, an app like, like for flight where you can do, you have your charts, you have your manuals, you have weight and balance, you have fuel calculators, you weather, it's all there. And it's amazing. I use it all the time. But one of the things that I was, you know, telling them today is, you know, I don't teach that to my students. And they say, why not? And I said, what happens when the phone battery dies or the iPad battery dies or the charger in the airplane doesn't work, you know, run through Murphy's laws. And, you know, if it can go wrong, it will. And your charts and maps will still be there. But a paper chart doesn't run out of battery. Absolutely. (laughs) So, you know, the old whiz wheel, you know, flight computer, you know, that if you know how to use it, you know, it's pretty scary accurate for old slide rule type technology. I think that's a really good overview of kind of where maybe your industry is going, but I, I'm seeing this all over the place too. Um, mm-hmm. Case in point, how many young people know how to drive like a manual car anymore? Yep. Maybe that maybe that's not the best example, but I I think it is an example of people. It's a good example. I can't do it. I, I, well, I, I could drive a tractor. <laughs> I can too. <laughs> uh, but but that's a great example, you know, of 
you know, a comparison, like we talked about the tail dragger, you know, that's a good comparison. You know, how many people can drive a manual, how many, you know, pilots can fly, you know, proficiently and safely fly a tail dragger. You know, it's two different schools of, you know, schools of thought and, you know, two different, you know, eras of, I'd almost call it of technology, but. Well, I, I think we maybe got a preview for your answer to this question, but what advice would you give, say, say a young person um, who's interested in doing what you do, was an interest in being a pilot, what would you say to them? Definitely, once you have the license, once you have your private pilot's license, what you've just obtained is your, your ticket to learn. It's your, your license to learn. Um, even at, you know, 4,000 plus hours, I'm still learning something new every day. You know, every flight that I do, every, you know, lesson that I teach, every time I'm around an airplane or talking to a different pilot, and they could be a student pilot or, a, you know, just, you know, multi-thousand hour private pilot or flying for the airlines. I learned something and I'm open and receptive to that. Um, and that's, you know, that would probably be one of the biggest pieces of advice is, you know, always be willing to learn and, you know, accept new, new information. Don't just, you know, let the egos say, you know, I've been doing this for, you know, 20 years and, you know, 5 billion hours, you know, I, I know everything that there is, you know, and guarantee you, you don't. Mm. That's, yeah. that's pretty, it's pretty comprehensive advice for most fields. I was yeah. going to say like, that's <laughs> <laughs> just tell that to everyone. Um, yeah. I think we all need to hear that. Right. All right. Do, do you want to go over the most important question, John? James, I, I thought you'd never ask, Jeremy. <laughs> uh, I, I take it you've, you've looked over the list of questions that we might ask you, so you know this one's coming. This is the most important one. Uh, what is your favorite pizza topping? Oh, geez. <laughs> Definitely pepperoni and mushroom. Really? Mm-hmm. I thought you were going to stop at pepperoni, just say pepperoni, and that's it. Then you threw in the mushroom. That's like a curveball. I was going to say, put them both together. You're doing pretty good. Really? Huh. I, See, don't I thought know. you were going to ask me something about like Moxie or Coke or something like that. And... Oh, what's, okay. what's your favorite soda? That's, that's, an, that's, that's a truly important question for a Mainer. Mo Moxie, obviously. Okay. We, I was going to say, we can't end this without talking about Moxie. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremy, why don't you tell us for a moment in your own words, this is more important than all the other parts. What does Moxie taste like? Ah, uh, boy. James, help me out here. <laughs> I say it tastes like cough syrup and dirt, but in the best possible way. Uh, and you still drink it. <laughs> I do. I would say like Dr. Pepper, root beer, and cream soda all in one. It, it's Whatever it is, it's distinctively different. It's It's got a very like NyQuil-like <laughs> effect where it kind of coats your throat. <laughs> You taste it for a while, and if you used to have a cough, you stop coughing for a little bit. Um, and yep. But mostly, it tastes like tradition. You know, it is the oldest continuously made soft drink in the country, so Absolutely. you're drinking history there. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, I have a word of warning for you guys. Uh, I have a a relative who's got the coronavirus, and he said he drank some moxie and it tasted bland. Ooh. So like, it, this is dangerous stuff. Wow. Moxie has never been bland ever. Um, if, if, if we need a test to determine if people's taste buds still work, give them a moxie. <laughs> and if they yeah, have no know. expression, we know something's terribly wrong. Um, oh, man. Where, where can people follow you or what you do or just something fun in your field if they're interested in, you know, um, the social? So for, I was going to say for, you know, the two companies that I fly for, for Penobscot Island Air, which is the, air taxi flying out to the islands of Maine. Um, we are on Facebook uh, under Penobscot Island Air. 
Um, also on Instagram, I probably ought to keep up with that a little bit more. Um, and then for my flight school, uh, Higher Ground Aviation, LLC, um, website, Facebook, there'll eventually be an Instagram whenever I get around to it. But um, yeah. All right, there you have it then. All right, any uh, final, I think we're about to wrap up. Any any last comments or, or uh, things you wanted to discuss, Jeremy? No, like I said, you know, thanks for having me and, you know, thinking of me for, you know, doing these podcasts and, you know, hopefully well, sometime. out early on. Well, no problem. Hopefully, you know, somewhere down the line we can do it again. Yeah, I, I think uh, – I think when you're up in Alaska, maybe we could plan a sequel. I think that'd be a fun one. <laughs> there we go. We'll have to get we'll have to get John up in the air when you're up in Maine next time. Yep, we can do that. I, yeah. I know a guy who'll show you around. Yeah. Well, you know, again, very good. Uh, thanks for joining us. I think we we both well, <laughs> James, you're you're uh, long time friends with Jeremy, but I know I I learned a, a lot about aircraft and what you do so really thank you for that and no, uh, no problem yeah, yeah most of what i know about planes came from came from jeremy anyway there you go <laughs> all right well again thanks for being on and uh we'll call it there thank you all right awesome thanks guys all right sure